Um, I was taught that uh, as an undergraduate, the justified true belief, which is a view that goes back again to Plato and Aristotle as a definition of knowledge, uh, had some serious problems in the so-called Gettier cases where a belief could be um, justified and true, but not knowledge, or something could be known without being either justified or without being true uh, because of the justification. And, and that debate's been going now for 40 years and, and I'm, I'm not, um, uh, I, don't, I don't have anything much to offer about that. But my view about knowledge is that it's um, a community-based thing. It's not something an individual has. In order to have knowledge, you need to have um, an epistemic community. That is to say, you need to have people who are experts, who can evaluate what you do and what you say. But in my view, you don't have uh, knowledge on your own, right? You don't just have a belief and you justify it and you find out it is true. You need to have an epistemic community uh, in the sense that um, there are those who can evaluate your claims to know something, who can um, uh, correct you when you do it wrong. And in many ways, this goes back to the Wittgensteinian question of whether you can follow a private rule. Uh, if you've got rules for having knowledge, and surely we do, there are things we count as knowledge because they meet some criteria. Um, you can't know that you're applying those criteria correctly unless you are in a community of people who could give you cross bearings on it, uh, as Popper once said. Uh, so uh, in, in my view, knowledge is a state between the knower, the things known, and the knower's community. It's a three place relation, so to speak. So it's, it's not just that Einstein was an expert on physics. There were many experts on physics who weren't sure about relativity for many years. Um, it's not that Einstein had worked it out in his head and you know, obviously published it, which he surely had. It was that Einstein was able to convince other experts that he was right. In other words, uh, it, it became knowledge to the extent that the epistemic community of physicists were able to test and try and explore the ideas that he'd come up with. And um, uh, hence, it's not just Einstein that matters here, right? It's everybody else. We're still testing Einstein's predictions. I believe that the, um, there was a test done with a satellite just recently, which upped the precision another few decimal places. Um, so that is a process. That makes knowledge a process. And science is a process of knowledge gathering and knowledge creation. The, the, the further issues of um, understanding, I think understanding most of the time is something that individuals have. Right? But it's not just in the head, the way knowledge is not just in the head. I can say I know how to calculate a logarithm, which I don't, but I can say that I do, um, and I can do that. But the use of logarithms in calculations and mathematics didn't begin and end with Napier. They, they've they've been, uh, become part of the general epistemic backdrop. And so I think that um, communities have understandings, communities have knowledge, uh, communities uh, can be mistaken, just as individuals can. And the structure of science itself has uh, multiple levels of collective knowledge and understanding. You, you have the understanding of people in a lab, you have understanding of people in a, uh, a collaboration collaborative project, understanding of people in a sub-discipline, right, as against the rest of the discipline, uh, understanding of a discipline as against outside the discipline, understanding of the broad community 
uh, that employs this knowledge. For example, engineers often employ uh, physical and chemical knowledge, uh, metallurgical knowledge and so forth, which they don't fully understand how it was gotten, but they understand what they can do with it. So understanding builds on understanding. Uh, but if you wanted a simplification, I can't do better than the one uh, that I came across. I wish I could remember who this was from. Uh, it was an AI researcher who stole a line from Frank Zappa, where he said, data is not information. Information is not knowledge. And knowledge is not wisdom. I would stick another one in between knowledge and wisdom and say, knowledge is not understanding. And understanding is not wisdom. Uh, you've got different criteria for each of those things. And ultimately, to my mind, understanding is taking a lot of knowledge and compressing it into um, a simplified general, generalization. And that simplified generalization allows of exceptions and allows of, uh, you know, not being projectable into uh, novel situations like high energy physics or, or modern proteomics or something like that. Um, but you've got knowledge so far as it goes, you've got understanding so far as it goes, and it's always worth asking to what extent um, that knowledge or understanding is conte contextualized by uh, the community, by the technologies, by the environment in which it's, it's practiced and so on, uh, and by the affordances that it gives us as a community and looking at what part of the community you're, you're talking about. Yeah, so, so the, the uh, quote was from Clifford Stoll, uh, quoting um, Joe's Garage by Frank Zappa uh, from 1972, I think. Um, very long ago in, in, in dog years, but uh, I remember that as years. Um, yeah, so why has there been such a focus on knowledge? And why has there been such a focus on propositions? Those are two very good questions. Uh, epistemology is, well, in the, in, in the last 25 years or so, there's been the growth of a thing called social epistemology. Uh, I'm not quite going down that route because social epistemology doesn't assume that there are facts of the matter about the things being known. Um, and I don't think you can apply that to science as well as you can, for example, to folk uh, epistemology like the aforementioned Balinese farmers. Um, but what you can say is that um, science, like every other project of, of knowledge gathering, whether it's technology or, or craft or art or whatever, um, science is done by human beings. And several things are true of human beings, and that is that our heuristics are never infallible, um, that they're always done with incomplete information, uh, uh, insufficient time and insufficient resources. Um, uh, Gerd Geigerenza and his um, uh, group, uh, uh, he's a psychologist, he calls this um, um, inference under uh, uncertainty. And I think this is absolutely true. We, we do everything we do in a state of uncertainty. Uh, and that raises the question why it is that science is so successful. Because if we're so uncertain about everything, how is it that we're able to send things uh, beyond the heliopause and uh, to the moon and, and uh, so on? Um, and I think this is because we've tended a little bit to overlook the fact that science is a social process. Now, social epistemologists and um, uh, social studies of science um, and technology uh, experts have been pushing this line for a while. I don't think it's quite caught up with a lot of us philosophers of science, that the engine of science is a community. A community with tools and a community with, with resources and a community of individuals who have different motivations and degrees of uh, expertise and, and uh, personality types. 
Um, David Hull, the famous philosopher of biology, once said that one of the driving motivations of science is what he called, I'm going to get that son of a bitch motive. Uh, and I've seen plenty of evidence of that. Um, but I've also encountered numerous scientists who've been absolute sweethearts and more than happy to share information with students and other people, uh, even if it means they get the credit and, and the scientist doesn't. Um, so I think um, we need to actually look at how it is that uh, n these are not knowledge confounding aspects of science, they're the engine of science, they're the things that drive science. And it's not just competition, it's competition and it's cooperation, it's a whole heap of, of motivations and modalities. Um, so when we can say that understanding has been achieved by a person or a community about something, it's because of all of these things. Now, AI researchers would understand this as a hill climbing algorithm. That is, you randomly have stuff happening and when you hit on a solution that is better than the current best solution, you start there and then you randomly try stuff. And hopefully that way you climb a hill until you get to the local optimum solution to a problem. And if that works, you've made progress. You haven't necessarily achieved truth in with a capital T, but you've got an understanding of the phenomena and the domain that you, uh, of the problem that you're trying to resolve. Um, and the randomness there is important because it stops you getting stuck on suboptimal peaks or you know a plateau halfway up the hill. <laughs> stops you getting stuck on, on a plateau uh, halfway up the hill or, or a suboptimal peak or a suboptimal solution. Um, and that's why having people who are going to get that son of a bitch, and that's why having people who are more than happy to share, that's why having people who are conservative, that's why having people who are um, out there and you know, on the bleeding edge and taking risks, all of these things are necessary for knowledge to be generated in science. Um, and understanding is what you get when you've got enough knowledge and you can apply it and you can simplify it so that it can be comprehended. And that's something I haven't really talked about. If you look at the Middle Ages, and I love going back to the Middle Ages because there were some very, very smart people, particularly in the 12th and 13th centuries. When they talked about understanding, they used the word comprehension, to grasp. Now, apprehension is what you have when you are aware of something. Comprehension is something when it's in your brain, in, well, they wouldn't have said brain, but in your mind, in your understanding, you comprehend something when you know what it's going to do or you know what you have to do with it. Um, and while that's a very theological, um, philosophical approach, I don't see that we've really done much better than that with all of the, the formal model, axiomatic, propositional notions of understanding. The Middle Ages, you know, the, the, the scholastics uh, understood that you might not actually be able to put things into words. Right? Some things were just experiential. Some things were shared in a community. And, and I often go back to them to find inspiration because they weren't just blithely following Aristotle or Aquinas. They were arguing every step of the way. And... Um, um, they often would say Aristotle doesn't know what he's talking about. So um, I think that uh, there's a bit of a myth that we've only just gotten to this notion of understanding. I think uh, human beings have always been about the same smart as they are now. The difference is uh, what we're building on and what we can transmit. And when we can no longer transmit stuff, then the understanding simply goes into the rituals like it does in Bali. People don't know why they release water on this day anymore, but they do it because it's the ritual and it works. And if it stopped working, if the, the climate changed and the water came earlier, as may very well happen, um, the rituals over time would adjust. Right? And this is what we find with um, ritual knowledge in general. 
I think a lot of scientific knowledge is ritual knowledge. People have forgotten, for example, why you apply the statistical methodologies that people apply. Nobody goes back to a friend of mine, uh, uh, Jason Grossman, uh, who teaches at the University of Canberra. Jason had a project going, I don't know how far he's gone with it, to go back to the original papers which introduced things like the t-test and the p-values and so on and see what the justifications for them are and see whether or not confidence intervals say what people think they say today and most of the time the science just uses these things they're ritual behaviors i suspect that's probably a way of offloading cognitive work right you just do what other people have done because it saves you having to reinvent the wheel. Whether or not understanding is expressible in a language is, is obviously a key problem for the AI approach to understanding because they must express uh, things algorithmically. Um, and I think that in the sciences, uh, understanding is often expressed in terms of statistical analyses. Uh, we don't. We no longer come up with laws. For instance, um, the uh, what used to be a law is now generally the behaviour of a simulated or modelled system. So we are not um, um, not so tied into this this uh, natural law language that we used to have. But it's still an expression, right? To express something as a law or a, uh, a ruling generalization in a particular domain. Uh, that's still an expression. When a community can no longer express these things, for instance, with ritual knowledge, it can still be reconstructed from outside. I mean, anthropologists, um, uh, I think it was Landers um, in, in Bali, uh, they can figure this out. They can reconstruct it. Right? They can say if they use this calendar, they will get the optimal use of water and the optimal crop uh, will, will result. Um, they don't know it, right? And possibly they never did. Possibly this is a, a social uh, set of uh, rituals that have evolved to adapt to their environment in very much the way an organism would evolve. But then the same thing can be said of science and has been. Uh, David Hull, I said, uh, mentioned before, David wrote a book called Science as a Process, which is about science evolving as an adaptive process. What was never clear with David's view is what it's adapting to, what's the environment, right? And the answer is, it's adapting not only to the non-human environment or to the objects of study, it's adapting also to the knowledge community and what that community is capable of holding in their collective heads or in their programs or books or journal articles or whatever. Uh, so you, there is a way in which you can say any science knows more than any individual scientist because the knowledge is had the understanding is had in that community, even if people don't know that it's had. Right? And if nobody ever looked at the reasons for statistical analyses ever again, so long as that ritual knowledge was passed on, statistics is still doing its job. And uh, of course, I'm not even talking about all of the implicit knowledge that science has, you know, how to focus a microscope. Right, how to light, uh, how to do dark field or bright field illumination, all this sort of stuff. Uh, most of that's not written down anywhere. It's shown, it's demonstrated, it's learned by individual trial and error sometimes. So understanding is not a simple thing that can be expressed, but I think it's potentially expressible. Um, and I think if we gave that up, we'd be giving up science altogether. All right, so I, th I think the, the future of, of understanding, understanding and um, epistemology in general um, 
is to continue following the path that it's been following for some time, and that is to look more at the social element, but also, I think, to look at the uh, informational element. Um, now, I know that there's a, a lot of philosophy of information at the moment um, out there, um, and I'm not really dealing with that. Uh, what I'm saying is that... Um, To say that we've learned something means that we've acquired information about it. To say that we as a uh, research community have learned about immunology is to say that we've acquired information we did not have. To say that we understand the immune system, if I'm right, is to say that we can generate some more or less precise rules about the way the immune system works. Um, so in effect, what we do is when we learn things, we gain information and we summarize it and we compress it. Uh, so I think that there's a sense in which we've got to look at understanding, cognition, knowledge generation, knowledge gathering. Um, all of these things have got to be understood as quasi-mathematical processes in the sense that we are doing things that can be modelled as uh, compressibility, right? So when you compress a file into a zip file, right, you can do it losslessly or loss lossly. You know, you can, you can lose information for a JPEG or you can not lose information for a portable network graphics file. Um, if you think about us compressing something into a picture, as it were, of the world that we can hold in our individual or collective heads um, and thereby say, we know the landscape, we know what we're dealing with here, we understand what it does. Um, the question is, how much compression do you need to do and for what end? So what starts out as a simple question, what is information, what is understanding, what is knowledge, becomes a very complex answer. And I think that what we're doing is we're just scratching the surface of how complex that really is. Um, any individual case of knowledge has its particular history, its particular players and agents, whether they're individual or corporate. Uh, it has its particular socio-historical context. Uh, it has its particular goals. So at that point, you are having to basically give a historical account of each act of knowledge and understanding. And I love that because I'm a historian as well and I think that's uh, how you should proceed. There aren't general rules that cover human thinking all the way, right? Humans don't think the same in each context. There's a book out um, just recently, uh, I think it's called something like How People Think. Um, and we're just starting to realise the world isn't just Western, educated, industrialised, rich and democratic undergraduate students, um, or weird, as they call it in psychology, that there are multiple communities, multiple cultures, multiple histories, multiple backdrops and multiple stages in the evolution of our current state. So um, it might be that we actually reached peak intelligence 250, 300,000 years ago, everything else has been cultural or socio-cultural socio or socio-economic even. Um, it might be that we're no, and I would argue this, we're no more innovative now than we were, you know, 200,000 years ago. It's just that we live in much bigger communities and so innovations are more likely to spread and be passed on and retained. Um, the uh, uh, Tasmanian Aboriginals, for example, lost the use of fire. Somebody was the person who had the knowledge of how to make fire, and that person was unable, for one reason or another, to pass it on. So they didn't have fire until they were reconnected to the uh, mainland populations. It's all about the, the context, it's all about the history. And that's where I'd like to 
pretty much leave it and say, that's where we've got to do our work. Right? We can theorize from armchairs all we like. In the end, you've got to actually look at what people really do in science or anything.